from roaring success to a spiral of destructiveness, Chad Lowe plays the portraits of country legend John Denver. Take me home at 11.20. First on BBC One, the end of Tony Blair's reign. The day after Tony Blair ended his 10 years as Prime Minister, he was in his constituency home in the North East. Blair said he was reconciled to handing over power. I think I should be cutting down the coffee, actually. But in terms of the job, well, I don't know, I suppose, you know, there will be days that I wake up and think, oh, I want to be there, I should be at the centre of events and all the rest of it, but you just got to be big enough to kind of give it away. We filmed with Tony Blair in the weeks before he left Downing Street as he tried to secure his legacy. He had become a divisive and unpopular prime minister. At the very moment when I was becoming less popular and less publicly acceptable was when I felt actually a greater confidence. Blair left wanting Britain to know it had been led by a man with a profound sense of right and wrong. Hand on heart, I did what I thought was right. But the light that guides Tony Blair has been obscured from the people who elected him. As I was saying, there's no point in me denying it. I happen to have religious conviction. I don't actually think there's anything wrong in having religious conviction. Um, <clears throat> on the contrary, I think it's a strength for people. This is the story of Tony Blair's journey from public adulation to defiant isolation, and the religious faith that sustained him as his popularity ebbed away. Okay. During Tony Blair's final weeks, Prime Minister, and several times since, he talked to Times journalist David Aronovich about the big questions of his time at number 10. Blair left office derided and mistrusted by many. But at the beginning, everything looked bright. In 1997, Blair had brought together left and right, young and old, and won a landslide election victory. He was the most popular politician of his generation. He came into office in 1997 as a sort of bright, sort of bushy-tailed, enthusiastic uh, uh, person with, you know, a very keen sense of wanting to change things and do right, uh, very conscientious, unfailingly courteous. When I met people and, and, and other people from the office went out there and met people, people would say, look, I'm going to vote Blair. They didn't say, I'm going to vote Labour. They said, we're not sure about Labour, but this Blair person is different, and he knew that. He had a certain irreverence towards Britain's institutions and conventions that went along with his view that he was new, he was starting afresh, that, uh, you know, the ludicrous idea that this was a young country. Blair was, at 43, the youngest prime minister in nearly 200 years. When he arrived at Buckingham Palace to meet the Queen after his election victory, the public saw an ordinary guy, not a stuffy member of the establishment. Blair was not even aware of the correct protocol for his historic meeting with the monarch. I think I probably took too literally the fact that you were supposed to kiss the hands. I mean, I thought you maybe kissed the hands where I think it was... It's, it's, that it, it's simply a formal thing to kiss the hands. Anyway. Know, it's called hand kissing, but you're not actually supposed to kiss the hand, and you did. <laughs> I, I can, what, what did the movie do, anyway? What did it say? The duty falls upon me as your sovereign to invite you to become prime minister and to form a government in my name. The film, The Queen, depicts this incident. And if you agree, the custom is to say yes. Yes. I mean, the prime minister was the first and only job in government I've had. Um, I don't know how many other... Prime Ministers, you'd say that of, actually. 
For all the fresh, modern appeal of Blair's personality, there was much the public didn't know about what he stood for. Blair had been elected on a modest, uncontroversial program designed to put off as few people as possible. Broad-based party, not attached to narrow or sectional or class interests, that represents all the best of the values of the centre and centre-left. Blair now acknowledges that the all-important pledges on which Labour fought the 1997 election, like getting waiting lists down and keeping inflation low, were extremely limited in scope. I mean, if you look at that little, that little card, the, the pledge card with the five pledges on them, those pledges were extraordinarily modest. Um, and actually, we fulfilled them all. At the beginning, uh, the man with the plan was thinking rather more in sort of generalities and principles, strong principles, I mean, that defined what he stood for and what he wanted to do with and to the Labour Party and then with and to uh, the country. It seemed as though the number one priority was to send the public the right messages about their dynamic government. A notorious leaked memo written by Tony Blair himself implored his staff to come up with eye-catching initiatives. He wrote, I should be personally associated with as much of this as possible. That a thug might think twice about kicking your gate, throwing traffic cones around your street, or hurling abuse into the night sky if he thought he might get picked up by the police, taken to a cash point, and asked to pay an on-the-spot fine of, for example, £100. Frequently at the Department for Culture, what would happen is on a Friday afternoon, we get a call saying, you know, we need to have a great football story for the Sunday papers. Uh, uh, well, uh, to which the only respectable answer was, sorry, bugger off, there is not a great football story for the Sunday papers, and that's it. But they were desperate for us to be feeding stories that would fit into a grid, and I think that's the kind of thing that drove initiativeitis. In a way, we as a government operated in the first, yeah, first, maybe first year, a bit like we were still operating in, in opposition. And it, it did some, I think it did some damage, actually, because some of it then looked like sort of initiativeitis, which, which you are prone to in opposition. In fact, you're obliged to do in opposition, whereas in government, actually, it's, it's about a longer-term view. Even some of his own ministers felt there was a superficial element to New Labour's message. The first term was characterised by this ghastly managerial jargon. We talked about it in terms of targets, key performance indicators, and all sorts of acronyms that people never understood. And um, for a number of years, I used to have my little book of bollocks that I used to, um, you know, I used to add f choice phrases to, and I'll publish it one day. In time, Blair's tone would change completely. But at the beginning of his reign, the issues that landed on his plate played to his strengths. His ability to listen, charm, persuade, and strike the right note. And that allowed him to prolong his honeymoon with the British people. The first I knew of the Diana's accident was literally a, a pager message from the Labour Party media monitoring and it said um, uh, car crash in Paris Dodie killed Diana very hurt this is not a joke Tony was up in Sedgefield they actually had, had some difficulty waking him up during the night we just kind of were chatting we did sort of kick around when would he have to say something? What should it, what should he say? He was very conscious straight away of this being the first moment in his premiership at which the country was going to be looking at him in a certain way. Looking at him, if you like, f not for leadership in the conventional sense, but for an understanding that as the democratic leader of the country, he would understand what people were thinking, what people, how people were, were responding to this. And he was, he was on to that very, very quickly. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you can be sort of pompous about it and say it's the role of a prime minister at that point to articulate the feelings of the country or try to, um, but it's not really how I felt. I felt as I felt. I was genuinely shocked. I was really sorry. 
about her and for her. Um, and I knew at a moment like that, you know, people wanted, people wanted it said. Alistair Campbell was in London, but Tony Blair's constituency agent, John Burton, was with him in Sedgefield. He just had a dinner with her, I think, just a week or so before that, uh, and was arranging to meet her again, I think, and, and he was told me later how absolute, absolutely stunning she was and, uh, and so beautiful. Uh, and, and I think they got on very well together. Yeah, we went up uh, in the car. I, um, it was raining. I remember I got out of the car and had an umbrella for a, a short while and then thought, no, this doesn't look right. So I, I, I just left him and, and went to one side. But I, I, no, there was no rehearsal or anything. I mean, that just came straight out, really, the People's Princess. She was the People's Princess. And that's how she will stay, how she will remain in our hearts and in our memories forever. Was that a phrase you your, that originated with you yourself? It, it, it was. I mean, I know there's a sort of uh, the, there's the usual stuff around it, but um, I mean, I actually just scribbled down on a piece of paper. I mean, I only had a, a short time to do it before I think it was I was going to church in the morning, so it it, it uh, so I, I scribbled down what I said, and it's, it's just it seems and, and indeed is now a very obvious thing to say. Blair's emotional statement provided the script for an extraordinary outpouring of public grief. Many British people felt they had a prime minister who could connect with them on an instinctive level. Within a year of taking power, Blair's abilities as listener and persuader found another historic opportunity in Northern Ireland. Blair believed he was the man to restart the peace process. We can either carry on with the hatred and the despair and the killing, treating people as if they weren't parts of humanity, or we can try and settle our differences by negotiation, by discussion, by debate. His task? To get Republicans who wanted a united Ireland and Unionists who wanted Northern Ireland to stay part of Britain to agree about how to govern the province. The general view, and particularly from my friends, which means it was a sincerely held view, was that you're, you're, you're completely nuts. This thing won't, won't work. So by all means, have a go at it, but don't be under any illusions. You know, they hate each other. They always will hate each other. It's been going on for decades, centuries, and, and it just it can't be reconciled. Blair quickly showed he was prepared to use pressure. My message to Sinn Féin is clear. The settlement train is leaving. I want you on that train, but it is leaving anyway, and I will not allow it to wait for you. But Blair was also adept at relating to the seemingly unmovable stances of both sides. He had a feel for it from early on. He understood it. And in his own way, I think he got to like um, a, a lot of the, the characters on all sides, even if they were diametrically opposed to what he believed in. He was very good at convincing all the parties, in the sense that he was their best friend in this negotiation against all the others. Um, and that was a rather effective, slightly risky, but a very effective tactic uh, in the way the, the dynamics of negotiation worked. What impressed me from, about Tony Blair from the very beginning was that he was prepared to acknowledge that uh, Britain's involvement in the north of Ireland wasn't all that it should have been. The Prime Minister was very clear right from the outset about what we called the principle of consent, that there could be no change in the status of Northern Ireland without the agreement of the people of Northern Ireland. In the course of the peace process, he did attempt to be all things to all people, but we understood that. Just before Easter 1998, he gambled on his ability to charm and persuade all sides towards agreement. A deadline had been set for the two sides to make a deal at Stormont. Soon after he flew in, Blair famously used a news announcement to raise the stakes. A day like today, I mean, it's not a day for sort of sound bites, really. 
Um, you can leave those at home, but I feel that I feel the hand of history upon our shoulder in respect of this. I really do. For 48 hours, Blair and the Irish Prime Minister Bertie Ahern shuttled between Unionists and Republicans, trying everything to bring them together. I think one of the early meetings um, that Tony Blair would have had with Sinn Féin was actually the morning of Good Friday, um, when I think that meeting started at about 3 a.m. Um, but at that stage, it, 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 it was clear uh, that he was prepared to, as people were saying at the time, go the extra mile to, to try and deal with the issue. By the night of the deadline, an agreement was drafted. But David Trimble, the unionist leader, felt he could not sign. Towards morning on the 10th of April, Trimble went to see Blair to express his fear that the text would not force the IRA to give up its weapons. When we went to see the Prime Minister at that stage, the very last minute, uh, we knew that the agreement could not be changed. We sought further assurance from the government. And uh, what they said then, uh, and what they said was carefully drafted, uh, was actually quite crucial to the making of the agreement from our party point of view. There was an acceptance by all the people involved uh, that Tony Blair and I uh, we're not going to go away, you know, that we deserve to be listened to, uh, that we were right in that there was a better future, and that you know, Tony in particular had risked a lot of his political uh, credibility uh, on the, the, the Northern Ireland project. The two governments and the political parties of Northern Ireland have reached agreement. It is the people of Northern Ireland who will decide democratically their own future. A peace settlement was finally announced on the 10th of April, 1998, a landmark in Northern Ireland's long journey away from violence. Blair's role in the Good Friday Agreement amplified all the positives he seemed to represent. Blair was modern, optimistic, and blessed with an aptitude for bringing people together. That there was something extraordinarily old-fashioned about the dispute, I just felt. I mean, Catholic, Protestant, the end of the 20th century, it's just, I mean, why? What's the point? You know, I mean, it should be settled. I mean, it's, a, it, it's it, you know, sometimes, I mean, both a strength and a weakness of, of myself in politics is that I'm, a, I'm very rational in, in terms of how I analyze the situation and think, well, if it's, if it's rational, then it should happen. And of course, life's not like that, and politics certainly isn't like that. But, you know, I tend to start from that uh, perspective. And so in relation to Ireland, I, I kind of felt, of course it can be done, because it should be done, because it's not reasonable in today's world that you carry on with a dispute like this. Blair was on a high, but while the public saw the fruits of his charm and persuasiveness, behind the scenes, Blair used a robust approach to exert strict personal control. He had brought into government a press secretary who knew how to bully the media into the right line. Wait a minute, let me answer the question. I'll answer it in my way, not your way. Facts. Is that FT story, story right facts. or wrong? Can I'm, you, can you well, just tell us whether it's right or no, wrong? No, you tell me what you're saying about the FT story. And I would say, to them, look, you know, you think you've been setting the agenda, we're going to set the agenda. Well, the FT story had nothing to do with any of the people who worked for Tony Blair. And this is the agenda, and you can try and push us off as much as you want. And Blair acted to concentrate decision-making power in his own hands. Cabinet was often no more than a rubber stamping body. Blair made the big decisions with small groups of his own hand-picked advisers. The way Tony managed his things is just to sort of keep his relationships personal, keep it close, um, and people know they can't stay in position unless they go along with his machine. No cabinet, no discussion. Something in the size of the cabinet was psychologically not the sort of body uh, that he felt comfortable having a thoroughgoing discussion in. Blair had made the decision to spend nearly £800 million on the Millennium Dome when most of the Cabinet was against it. The Cabinet had also been sidelined when Blair, with Gordon Brown, decided not to join the Euro in the first wave and to make the Bank of England independent. He was setting himself up to begin with as a kind of presidential Figure. Well, I don't think Tony Blair ever really got a cabinet government. What he wanted to do was to lead the government in a particular direction. He was impatient to do it, 
and he didn't see the value of those processes. If you went to see him at Downing Street, you would find him sitting in a little room, literally, on a sofa. Whereas previous prime ministers you would find sitting at the cabinet table uh, with a constant reminder around them by sitting at the cabinet table that that was where their authority came from, from the uh, cabinet, that they had to work with all of those colleagues. Blair was not, um, not interested in that. If the decision making uh, is going on, uh, as it were, below the radar and only a fait accompli is being presented uh, to the public, then that essential function uh, of representative democracy is simply being denied. The fact is, you're elected as Prime Minister to get the job done. Um, you know, you've got to assert your authority. If you don't assert your authority, then you just get absolutely submerged in, you know, endless debates and discussions. Nothing ever actually happens or is driven forward. Blair wanted the whole machinery of government to dance to his tune. One former civil servant remembers an occasion when top Whitehall mandarins were given instructions by a junior figure from 10 Downing Street. Initially, civil servants' reactions was, well, is this chap talking off the top of his head, or has he got real clout behind him? And it soon became clear that uh, if he said Tony once, he meant, or Tony once, as far as we were concerned. So it, it, was, a new, it was a new experience, and for some of my colleagues, um, it wasn't a terribly pleasant experience. The feeling was the mandarins might resort to fisticuffs. We did at one time have a bet on whether a very, very, very senior civil servant would actually hit him before the, the set of series of meetings we were going through was out. But of course he was a very, very, very serious a senior civil servant, so he wouldn't have dreamed of doing any such thing, but it was quite close, I think. <laughs> Has it ever bothered you that the two key words in Whitehall are Tony one? No, I think that's great. I mean, if that's what they're saying about the Prime Minister, I mean... What do we expect them to be saying? You know, I used to say this occasionally when we had this discussion with the civil servants about us. Um, I used to say to them, but I'm the Prime Minister. I was elected to get the job done, and that's what I want to happen. So what's, what's the problem? I mean, you know, you either get things done, in which case they'll say you're presidential, you're overweening, you're trying to be the head of state, or rather, you know, they'll give you all that nonsense, or alternatively, you don't do that, in which case you weaken and ineffectual and can't get things done. And I decided very early on it was best to have the former criticism, not, not the latter. Blair was learning to be ruthless. In early 2001, his friend, Peter Mandelson, the Northern Ireland secretary, was under pressure over allegations that he had helped obtain a passport for Sri Shand Hinduja, an Indian businessman who had provided funds for the Millennium Dome. When I left the government in January 2001, it was as a result of uh, an wholly unanticipated, <laughs> unevaluated 24-hour um, storm, uh, which produced headlines, not actually, you know, in all newspapers, and not actually all on the front page, but none were deemed sufficient. Uh, to see me out of office uh, two hours later. I found myself in this extraordinary situation where I was sort of carpeted in front of the Prime Minister, who also happened to be my best friend and closest ally, uh, with him basing uh, his view uh, of me on things that were not true and had not been properly analysed, but which I found myself totally unable to refute or to rebut. And, you know, there was Alistair sort of in the room, you know, with his fingers sort of, you know, rapping on the table, saying, you know, haven't you two finished yet? I've got a lobby to brief. The substance was about a wretched passport application. And on the substance, it would seem that Peter was, was in the right. Uh, I am today resigning uh, from the government and wish to set out the background uh, to my decision. The case against Mandelson was still in the balance, but Blair was willing to throw his old friend to the wolves. The accurate way to put it is that everyone would have behaved differently, but actually, did he do something at f in fundamental terms that was wrong? No, he didn't. And actually, I remember that day, I was about, I think, to go into Prime Minister's questions. The right honourable gentleman has been central to everything the Prime Minister has done. It was the right honourable gentleman who picked him out. 
the right honourable gentleman who briefed the press for him, the right honourable gentleman who stabbed the Chancellor in the back for him. So I knew you'd have a sort of bit of a baying mob, and I also knew it was totally unfair on him, really. Totally unfair, but... Blair was accumulating great personal power, but his message to the public was still mainly cautious and consensual. When Blair fought a second general election in 2001, there was little clue of the controversies that would rage in the years ahead. It was a very timid manifesto. I was wheeled into a meeting with the Prime Minister and all his advisers, and Tony said, well, uh, what do you think of it, Matthew? And I said, well, I think it's boring and irritating. <laughs> and there was this long pause, and people sort of shuffled around and looked at their feet, and then Tony turned to someone else and said, well, now, back to business, and the conversation <laughs> continued. Labour's appeal to voters in 2001 was based on another series of uncontroversial pledges. To keep inflation low, to have more teachers, nurses, doctors and police, and not to scrap the winter fuel payment for pensioners. Again, Blair's reassuring approach won him a huge majority. But in September 2001, just three months after the election, events began to reveal a different kind of political leader. Blair had to find his own response to the attack on the World Trade Center. He visited America days afterwards. It seemed his religious faith had a strong influence on his personal reaction. Around the whole of the world, there is the most profound solidarity. There is the determination to build hope out of tragedy. There is the surging of the human spirit. Blair's religious convictions had, until this point, been largely concealed. After the terrible now they began to surface. Events of last week. It does, I think, inform a lot of what he thinks and says and does. Um, but partly because he's, you know, kind of pretty irreverent and he swears a fair bit and he, you know, he'll, if he sees a very attractive woman, his eye will wander and, and all that stuff. You don't, he doesn't look like your classic religious sort of guy. He's not an exhibitionist when it comes to religion, but deep inside him it is very, very important. And this is a man who takes a Bible with him wherever he goes and the last thing at night, you know, he will read from the Bible. I think his close circle always understood that there was a part of him that that was really, really important. I mean, just on the logistical level, wherever you were in the world on a Sunday, you had to find a church. As we were on that kind of spiritual level, it did inform a lot of what he talked about, what he read, as you say, what he uh, felt was important. Now, Blair is at last willing to acknowledge that religious faith was at the very centre of the way he governed. As I would say, there's no point in me denying it. I happen to have religious conviction. I don't actually think there's anything wrong in having religious conviction. Um, <clears throat> on the contrary, I think it's a strength for people. You know, you can't have religious faith and it be an insignificant aspect because it's, it, it's, it's profound about you and about how, how you are as a human being. You know, it, if, if I'm honest about it, yes, of course, it was, it was hugely important. But Blair didn't speak freely about his religious beliefs when he was Prime Minister. Alistair Campbell made sure the public didn't hear too much about God. The reason that uh, Alistair, my press secretary, said we don't do God was not because actually he's opposed to religious faith, but because you always get into trouble talking about it. So anyway, here we are talking about it. Well, he does do God um, in quite a big way. But I just always worry, in Britain, the public are a bit wary of politicians who go on about God. I said, my worry is that the Tories will pick this up and say, this is you saying, to be a Christian, you've got to be Labour. And that's just a bad political position to be in. Well, the people didn't know about this strong ethical position. The public might have been less willing uh, to give him uh, the triumph of three consecutive general election victories uh, if they'd known the extent to which ethical values would overshadow pragmatism. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? 
Sometimes, spin doctor's anxieties about Blair and religion reached farcical levels. One Easter, John Burton was approached by a Labour Party aide who was anxious about Blair being photographed leaving church. He said, I would rather not have a picture of Tony and the cross in the same scene. So I said, well, it's no problem. <laughs> I, said, I said, we'll come out right at the end and we'll walk on the end of the procession. And I could see by his face, I said, is that, is that OK? Well, he said, actually, it would be better without the cross. So, <laughs> so I said, no, no, no. I said, the procession of the cross on Good Friday can't be done without the cross. George Bush, who would be Blair's partner in the war in Iraq, was also a committed Christian. You don't pray together, for example. No, we don't pray together, Jeremy, no. <laughs> why do you smile? Because, uh, why do you ask me the question? Because I'm trying to find out how you feel about it, yeah, I mean... Yeah. <laughs> Possibly. It's, it's difficult if you talk about religious faith in our political system. I mean, if you're in the American political system or others, then you can talk about religious faith and people say, well, that's you know, it's, it's fair enough, and it's, it's something they respond to quite naturally. You talk about it in our system, in fact, people do think you're a nutter. I mean, they sort of think, think, you know, you maybe go off and sit in the corner and, you know, commune with, with uh, um, the man upstairs and then come back and say, right, I've been told the answer and that's it. In early 2003, hostilities in Iraq were looming. The United States had amassed a formidable strike force in the Gulf and Blair was under enormous pressure. He had been used in the main to public acclaim. Now, he faced dismay and hostility. Mr Blair, you are attacking Iraq with George Bush, and it's not dissimilar to what Bin Laden or the Al-Qaeda network done to America. They killed 3,000 or more innocent victims. How many innocent victims are you going to kill, and how many people are going to suffer like I've suffered? But on the no, system. Mr. Blair, don't do it. Well, the accusation that wounded Blair was that he had not been honest about the reasons for going to war. Sanctions regime. But I don't believe and it. I think it's because well, George Bush has I, I, instigated I this because of revenge for September the 11th. Well, I, you could have gone in I there can't... three years ago when Clinton was in a power, but uh, it, you didn't. It, it's it's correct. You haven't um, instigated it. He has, and you're following. Well, let me just. Can I just answer the the point? What really got to him, I think, was when his integrity was questioned. He always felt whatever, we can disagree and we can have completely different views on things, but please don't question my motives and don't think I tried to trick you. And so when people accused him point blank of that, that did really get to him. In February 2003, the day before huge protests were due to take place right across Britain, Tony Blair was in Scotland to make a speech. He found time to meet an old school friend. Valentine's Day 2003 was probably quite a low point. Um, we went down to have a drink with him. He was holed up in the Caledonian Hotel preparing a speech for a speech he was going to make in Glasgow the next day. You know, Iraq was brewing, um, and he really was pretty day and he wasn't eating well, he was looking really thin, he was looking tired, and it really was. He seemed a very lonely person there, sort of holed up in the room preparing this speech. The next day saw the largest demonstration in British history. But Blair said it didn't matter how many people marched. His position was morally right. And as you watch your TV pictures of the march, just ponder this. If there are 500,000 on that march, that is still less than the number of people whose deaths Saddam has been responsible for. If there are one million, that is still less than the number of people that died in the wars that he started. When initial military success in Iraq gave way to long months of violence, Blair's isolation increased. His domestic plans were also mired in conflict. And the world was soon to be horrified by the spectacle of torture at Abu Ghraib. 
By 2004, he looked tired, his hair had gone gray, he looked quite arrestingly different from the Prime Minister who was elected in 1997. It was almost like a sort of a bit of a bit of a long sigh of, oh, you know, are we are we really going to get out? Are we going to get out of this? Are we, is, is what we're doing worthwhile? Can we really turn these things around? The suicide of David Kelly, the weapons inspector, had confronted Blair with two damaging accusations. That he had lied about Iraq's weapons of mass destruction and that the government's decision to name Kelly had led to his death. Have you got that on your hands, Prime Minister? Are you going to resign over this? Without any doubt at all, this got him down. What I was unaware of was how inside him he was not recovering, as well as I thought he was outwardly. Um, he didn't communicate about himself. He, he didn't talk about his innermost feelings. I think people were low and were depressed, and I think he was uh, as well, and especially when some of the atrocities started to come through from uh, Iraq, I think genuinely people felt maybe we can't get through this. I think that maybe it's not possible. Civilian casualties in Iraq mounted relentlessly. One study estimated that the number of people who had died as a consequence of the war was over 600,000. Blair says it was his religious faith that helped him live with the consequences of difficult decisions across the range of his responsibilities. To do this, this, this the Prime Minister's job properly, you need... Um, you, you need to be able to separate yourself somewhat from the magnitude of the consequences of the decisions you're taking the whole time. Which doesn't mean to say, and let me emphasize this, that you're insensitive to the magnitude of those consequences or that you don't feel them deeply. If you don't have that strength, it's difficult to do the job. Um, which is why the job is as much about character and temperament as it is about anything else. Um, but for me, having faith was an important part of being able to do that. But it's not, you know, I've said probably more than I intended to say about it, but it just, you know, in the end, that's, that's how, I mean, and I think that that is also important because ultimately, I think, you've got to do what you think is right in this job. And I learned that over, over time, really. Blair's popularity was tarnished for good. He had thought about resigning. But, sustained by his faith, Blair picked himself up. By autumn 2004, he was ready to usher in a new phase of his leadership, in which popularity would no longer matter. One evening that September, he phoned Peter Mandelson. He said, well, I've got some things to tell you. I said, well, what are they? He said, well, um, First of all, earlier in the year, when I thought I'd be leaving office rather quickly, uh, I bought a, you know, very large and slightly expensive house in central London. I said, well, so what? He said, well, I didn't tell anyone, and now it's going to appear in the Evening Standard tomorrow. I said, well, I said, you know, I think we'll recover. He said, well, the second thing is that I'm going into hospital tomorrow to have an operation on my heart. I said, on your heart? He said, no, 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 it's only a sort of murmur, it's only a thing that needs to be corrected, the beat needs to be changed or something. I said, OK, well, that's slightly more worrying than the house. He said, but also I'm going to announce uh, that uh, I'm not going to fight a fourth election. And I said, oh, I'm not sure that's such a brilliant idea. So are you, as you have this operation, um, considering how long you're going to stay on as Prime Minister? If I am elected, I would serve a full third term I do not want to serve a fourth term. I don't think the British people would want a Prime Minister to go on that long. Um, but I think it's sensible to make plain my intention now. At the 2005 general election, he did win a third victory, but his majority in Parliament was slashed. How does it feel to be part of a third term Labour government? <laughs> Blair said, 
that the result would make him change his way of thinking and start listening to voters again. I've listened and I've learned. And I think I have a very clear idea of what the British people now expect from this government for a third term. Blair's third term was not long underway when Islamist terrorism arrived in Britain. Blair's response to the suicide bombings of July the 7th, 2005, showed he could still, at times of crisis, find powerful words for a national tragedy. Today's bombings will not weaken in any way our resolve to uphold the most deeply held principles of our societies. But Blair was soon involved in confrontation once again. He wanted to push through a bill to allow the detention without charge of terror suspects for 90 days. For the first time since he became prime minister, Blair lost a major vote in parliament. The nose to the left, 322. But Blair now preferred being right to winning. Sometimes it is better to lose and do the right thing than to win and do the wrong thing. More and more, throughout his premiership, Blair resorted to asserting that his position was morally right. It's because it's the right thing to do. I believe it was the right thing to do now. This is simply the right thing to do. It's a very frustrating phrase because if, if I say to you, because it's the right thing to do, then you really, there's no forensic um, skill that you can exercise that can disturb that. It's a phrase of, uh, if you like, of last resort. But it's also a phrase which is impervious to argument. In the interviews Tony Blair conducted for this series, he showed that right and wrong remained crucial to his politics. If you're asking about leadership and how leadership operates, I think the only way it can operate effectively is when you've got the strength to do what you think is right. I'd always thought it was the right thing to do. You've got to do what you think is right. You know, I thought it was, it was the right thing to do, trying to do the right thing for the country. What the right thing to do with the health service is, I knew it was the right thing, God and I were fine about it, and I knew it was the right thing to do, and I wanted to get it done. This was the right thing to do, and I was just determined we should do it. He was, remember, he was a almost messianic politician in the way he saw himself in this way. It's, it is the one point of uh, a comparison, I think, that bears some weight in contrasting him and Margaret Thatcher, was that they were not so much conviction politicians, as some have said, but messianic politicians who believed that if they didn't carry the message of flame, if they weren't the carriers of the flame, then it would all get, get eroded. Across a range of issues at home and abroad, it was often Blair against the world. Increasingly, Blair trusted his own instincts, even if public opinion and the Labour Party were against him. Well, certainly in the third term, what drove Tony Blair was a sense of what he thought was right. Uh, he had come to a set of conclusions around the need for public service reform, for example, um, about the need for radical pensions reform, about the need to press on in Iraq. Uh, and he was just wasn't going to be thrown off those things by anybody or, or anything. Now, for some people, that's a sort of affront to democracy in the sense that, you know, he should have listened and he should have involved other people more. I think, he, I think he, he became steelier and steelier the longer he was in office. He became more experienced, uh, more, more driven, and, and, and by and large was more successful. In the first few years, he was more of a listener than he became. He became much more somebody who would say, he would lean back in his chair and say, well, so here's what I think about this. Here's what I think the problem is. And actually, that's because he had got it all worked out, and that's what people have never quite understood about him. You know, Tony would sometimes criticise himself, but the funny thing is, whenever he criticised himself, it was always to say, I should have listened to myself earlier. So he would merely criticise himself for not listening to his own internal voice sufficiently. Blair had completed a long journey away from his beginnings as Prime Minister. At the start, every strategy, every announcement, was measured to ensure maximum public support. By the end... Blair no longer cared about popularity. In the last few years of my premiership, I did become increasingly of the view that, you know, we needed to stand up for what was right, that, that I should do 
what was right. And therefore, in some ways, I think, also I've felt myself coming more into my own as a, as a prime minister. And the, the irony of my situation in a way was that at the very moment when I was becoming less popular and less publicly acceptable was when I felt actually a greater confidence in doing the job and taking the decisions and seeing it through. Blair's negative press reached such a level of intensity that he felt it rubbed off on anyone who got close to him. I used to say to people who would, were friends of mine or people who came into contact with me in, in public life, I used to say, look, you know, I'm a sort of... <laughs> there's something toxic about <laughs> being involved with me because, you know, if I come and see you or stay at your house or something like that, then before you know where you are, you, you, you know, you, you'll be in for the same treatment. I mean, not because they're really interested in you, but because they want to get in, at me, and it's just, like, it's just the way it is. We will have to go further. But I'm Blair was never more toxic than during the Cash for Honours affair, which was triggered when the Scottish National Party raised questions in Parliament and made a complaint to the police. Can the Prime Minister explain to this House that even before the loan scandal, before the Metropolitan Police investigation, 80 pence in every pound of individual donations to the Labour Party came from people who were subsequently ennobled by him? Blair had to defend himself against the accusation that he had handed out peerages in return for loans to the Labour Party. I have always abided by the recommendations of the Appointments Commission. I think it would be very difficult not to do so. There's not a single party leader I've ever come across who doesn't dislike the fact that you have to raise money for your political party, but you do. Blair's chief fundraiser, Lord Levy, found himself under personal attack. He was always upset that those who he regarded as close to him and hopefully those he really liked and respected, uh, that they would suffer um, because of that association. Call it toxic, call it um, what you will. He was always concerned by that, and actually, I believe, got upset by that. Lord Levy, who was arrested twice by the police but never charged, says he suffered personally. It was a very stressful period for me, for my wife, for my children, for my family, and for my friends. I'm very pleased it's all over and behind me and the others involved, but I would not want to add to that. The paradox for Tony Blair was that while he now governed through his own moral convictions, he was accused of immoral behavior. One of the other things which characterized the final, your final days in office was what became known as cash for honors. Honestly, there's absolutely no point. It's, it's done, it's over, Psh, move on. Um, and you can have that in about 15 different ways. It is true that some people per inside number 10 who are close to you paid a pretty hefty price for that episode. And, I, and uh, look, one of the things I think is important in, 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 in modern politics is that we just, we just don't get all these systems mixed up with each other. Uh, anyway, I've, I don't... Uh, there's, there's, there's really no point in going back over it again, and, and, and I meant what I said at, at, at the time. I issued a statement, and that's really all I've got to say on it. Blair now says he regrets the frequent attacks he himself made on the sleaze of the previous Conservative government. It was too easy to do, in a way. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, falling over in the penalty box when you know the referee's going to give a penalty. It's quite hard to resist doing it when your side's desperate to score a goal. But it's... Um, no, I don't feel uh, good about all that, because actually I think in the end it... it, it, it it, it actually conditioned a view of us two when we came in that was not sensible. Because the truth of the matter is, and this is something that's important to say, really, that is that, in my view, most people, whatever political party, come into public life trying to do the best for the country. And that the, the, the bad apples that there are are actually few and far between. Um, and it really doesn't help public life at all in the end when, you know, we end up trying to make it look as if our politics is sort of corrupt when it isn't. When in 2006, a crisis erupted in Lebanon, Blair's defiant isolation reached a new level. Israel unleashed a ferocious military onslaught against Lebanon. In retaliation, they said, for rocket attacks by Hezbollah. Hundreds of civilians died. Israel's actions were widely condemned, but Blair refused to call specifically on Israel to stop. 
The Lebanon crisis came upon us very quickly as a crisis and almost as a crisis of confidence in him. It became very personal. Even some of Blair's most loyal colleagues found his defiant position hard to bear. And I was worried above all because I thought that if we backed military action by the Israelis, uh, this would not end where the Israelis thought it would end. Did Tony not understand the complexity of this? Well, he did understand the complexities. He just came to a different view, and it's, I say, a matter of great regret that he did. Many Labour MPs were angry and troubled by Blair's stance. Prime Minister's characteristic refusal to give a few words of comfort to his own side because he felt that this would be would lessen the impact that he could have with the Israelis and with the Americans and with the Lebanese government. So, uh, you know, there are a number of people around him begging him to just throw a few words to keep the Labour Party happy, but you know, he was unwilling to do that. Lebanon was the last great controversy of Blair's premiership. By now, he was unrepentant about his personal rejection of the views of most British people. I mean, I'm afraid, you know, in the end, I came to a position that I think was out of sorts or in disagreement with, with certainly the bulk of our own opinion here. And I mean, that's something you, you have to accept, but, but... Including the Labour Party? Yeah, but I think in this, in this sense, the Labour Party were more representative of public opinion than I was, actually. In the, in the position that I was taking, but I felt it very, very strongly. Discontent over Lebanon led to an attempt by Labour MPs to force Blair out of office. But Blair, who had once counted every vote as sacred, would rather quit than give way. You need an inner strength to be able to take those difficult decisions, to wear the consequences of them, and to be prepared in the final analysis to say, well, that's it, OK, you know, Either my party disagrees with me or my country fundamentally disagrees with me. I happen to think this is the right thing. And, I, and therefore, I, I, I should go. And I think, you know, in the end, I mean, although I left on my own terms, I mean, truthfully, you know, I did end up with a disagreement with the country, in fact, over foreign policy, really, which is fair enough. I mean, you know, it's fair enough. Um, that's <laughs> People are entitled to think that. Blair was, finally forced to set a timetable for departure. As for my um, uh, timing and date of departure, I would have preferred to do this in my own way, but as has been pretty obvious um, from what many of my cabinet colleagues have said um, earlier in the week. The next party conference in a couple of weeks will be my last party conference as party leader. We were filming Tony Blair in the weeks before he left 10 Downing Street. It seemed that Blair had, right at the end, reconnected with the time when he had seemed more a healer, less a bringer of division. Blair's attentions turned full circle to Northern Ireland where he had played such an important role almost 10 years before. Blair wanted to secure agreement for unionists and nationalists to share power, and it seemed he had not lost his knack for persuasion and charm. You haven't made your application to the House of Lords yet, you guys. Not a bridge too far. Before he left, Blair did help secure a deal on power sharing. Just don't knock over Dr yes. Paisley, because that would be... Right at this stage, a bad move. <laughs> it's amazing to see uh, the people of Northern Ireland get on so well. This is an incredible this is thing. Awesome. Well, it shows it can be done. The only thing is it, 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 it did require some people with quite unusual leadership skills on either side to, to, to get it done. It's been an honour to serve. Privileged to work on this building. Thank you very much indeed. On the 27th of June, 2007, Blair left Downing Street to the cries of protesters still outraged at the Iraq War.
The next day, he was at his home in Sedgefield. His thoughts were on his new role as Middle East Peace Envoy. Instead of confrontation, he would be required once again to listen and persuade. You've been very diplomatic in your approaches with people, that you're seeing the people you need to see, you're smoothing some of the ruffled feathers, because you know, it's, it's always people have got different perspectives and different points of view, and they've got to be all looked after and gruntled, and yeah, so do a bit of that. <laughs> If he were to succeed in his new role and bring Israelis and Palestinians together, Blair might once again be seen as a healer. It could be catastrophic if, if people then give up hope on, on the, the, the Palestinian side. Um, and I feel a tremendous sense of urgency and mission, actually, about it. But today, Blair's personal legacy is still contested. The man who won Labour three historic terms in power, who tried to modernise Britain, and who played an important role in bringing peace to Northern Ireland, was also a prime mover in a divisive and bloody conflict. Who was this man, Blair? What did he try to do? What did he try to achieve? Like all of us, he probably didn't achieve everything he wanted, but he's done more than most. No one is going to look back in future decades and say this was one of the moments when aspects of British society were transformed. Uh, he sat on top of things rather than actively changed them. I admired the fact that here's a fellow who's willing to stand for what he believes uh, in the face of uh, criticisms or political consequence. He was willing to say, this is what I believe, and I'm going to stand, stand strong. Iraq was a disastrously stupid decision, which has damaged Britain's position in the world, has made us less safe, and really has made life more difficult for British people for a long time to come. And whatever Tony Blair did during his time at Number 10 Downing Street, the increased expenditure on health and education, the efforts to tackle poverty, all of these pale into insignificance against Iraq. Iraq will be his legacy and his epitaph. Despite the terrible events in Iraq, Tony Blair is still proud to have been Prime Minister. For all the, the pain and the... Um, uh, occasionally miserable times that you go through with it. I mean, what a thing to be able to do, and what a, what a tremendous honour to be able to, to, to be in a position like that where you can affect people's lives and sometimes you'll affect them for good and sometimes you, you won't have, and, and sometimes even affect them for ill. But the fact is, how many people in their lives get the chance to do something like that? I think that's... I think that's something that you can reflect on and, and then look forward with some, well, as ever, with some optimism. Tony Blair, thank you. Thank you. Is that that then? The story of Colorado's most famous singer-songwriter, John Denver. It's on late film Take Me Home next on BBC One.